you. Thank you so much for um, the opportunity to speak with all of you. And um, I'm really uh, glad to have this chance um, to, uh, you know, just answer any questions that people might have. Um, and I think that, you know, just taking a step back, just want to acknowledge that this is a difficult topic um, and that it's really, you know, going to bring up um, some, you know, might bring up some difficult emotions and that um, probably everyone else on the call is feeling similar um, and that, um, you know, just to reach out and connect with your support system um, and that, um, you know, it's, it's very important to get this kind of information, um, you know, so that you can plan and prepare for the future. And so I think I really want to just commend all of you for joining, um, even though the, I know the topic is difficult. So just a little bit about me. I'm a neurologist specialized in um, treating movement disorders like uh, Lewy body dementia. And um, I have a special um, interest in bringing palliative care to um, people with Lewy body dementia and other um, similar disorders. So today we're going to talk about caregiving in advanced LBD, and I'm going to focus on end-of-life care. I'm going to talk about prognostic indicators and then uh, advanced care planning. So care for the caregiver. So I want to talk about um, an important concept within palliative care called total pain, and that is that um, the pain of serious illness isn't just the physical suffering of the person who has the illness. Um, their serious illness affects the, the entire family and of course the, uh, the caregiver. And that um, the caregiver and the person suffering from the illness will have psychological, social, and spiritual suffering. And that um, a part of um, the wraparound care um, that palliative care really brings is to address all of these different components of, um, of pain that comes with serious illness and to really be able to treat them so that um, you know we can see uh, everyone as whole people not just as some as their diagnosis um, that isn't that isn't who that person is and um, that's not who the you know what the family is about and so we want to know um, you know in palliative care what um, what people's goals and priorities are and how the illness is really affecting all these other um, you know in addition to physical these other important aspects of life um, caregiving in advanced Lewy body dementia is um, you know it's, it's it's a tough part of caregiving in this in the disease course and um, that there are very normal, difficult emotions that can come with, um, with this um, part of the journey. Uh, grief is very common, um, anticipatory grief. So as someone is declining, and we know that they are at end of life, um, uh, if, you know, if they're a loved one, then um, it's normal to actually start the grieving process before they've passed. And that's called anticipatory grief. And it's a real um, difficult emotion and that we, you know, really encourage people to get support um, for that, um, you know, wherever, wherever um, they can recharge or get support, whether that's a spiritual community or um, through their friendship circle um, or their hiking club or whatever, wherever they get that connection. Um, most caregivers feel like they aren't doing a good enough job. Um, and you know, the, even though they really are, and even my SEAL Team 6 um, level caregivers are just never feel like they're doing a good enough job. And so that feeling of guilt is just so common um, and prevalent and um, really um, uh, is just a part of this difficult situation. And so needs to be acknowledged um, no matter, you know, uh, and, and also just to be able to, um, see just to be able to re uh, reflect that that is a very common difficult emotion and that other caregivers are going through that as well and then existential distress also um, and that's really where spiritual care comes in and really trying to answer those big questions of why us why me and um, you know just being able to reach out to um, 
a counselor, other type of um, provider that can help maybe just provide um, a, uh, a perspective on that, on those types of really difficult, very human questions. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about caregiver resilience. Um, and I work with a, a palliative care chaplain that has really kind of taught me everything that I know about this. But, um, you know, ultimately resilience really isn't about enduring. It's about um, how you recharge and bounce back. And so, you know, building resilience doesn't mean that um, you're uh, sort of building a repertoire, you know, of, of more stoicism to take on more more work and more, um, you know, more burden, more things. Actually, it's not, it's really understanding, you know, how do you recharge? How do you take a break that um, none of us can go on empty forever, right? That um, even SEAL Team 6 of caregivers need um, respite. And so really understanding that concept I think is important. And that caregiver burnout um, is real. It um, affects uh, your health outcomes. So, uh, you know, caregivers uh, are, who are burnt out, you know, get hospitalized more and actually have shorter life expectancies. Um, and burnout is actually a healthy adaptive response and what it's actually kind of, you can think of it as an alarm clock that's kind of saying, hold on, you're, you know, you're physically and emotionally exhausted and you need a break before this gets worse. And so, um, the first thing we need to do is notice the alarm is ringing before we can actually do anything about it. And so noticing is sometimes ref uh, referred to as mindfulness. And so um, this is just a depiction, you know, is your mind full um, or, is, or are you actually uh, being mindful? So what does self-care look like um, for caregivers? And so you want to notice um, or be mindful of any signs of burnout. So, um, you know, feelings of exhaustion um, uh, or uh, feelings of um, irritation um, towards the person that you're caring for. Um, just under, just kind of putting your well-being um, at, as important as the person that you're caring for. So, you know, with the plane analogy, you have to put your oxygen on first before you can give anyone else oxygen. So you have to find your well-being um, to sustain um, through this journey um, with your loved one. And what are the main kind of, the main three things to build, help you build resilience? The first is strengthening meaning in what you're doing and um, trying to kind of uh, get, to the root of your intention and purpose of being a caregiver for your loved one. And actually we know that caregiving for our loved ones is beneficial, um, is beneficial for um, uh, in many ways in terms of helping us um, understand, uh, you know, a, a purpose, um, you know, for our actions with, with, um, with our loved ones. And so strengthening that meaning and, and just kind of understanding going back to what that intention was, why are you here um, you know, as a caregiver for your loved one is important. Um, we say connection is protection in palliative care and that's, on, and that's not only connecting um, to others, you know, um, friends and things, but it's also connecting to yourself and what's important to yourself and brings you joy, um, connecting to your family and community, connecting to nature and then whatever the greater is for you. Um, having all those different levels of connection is really important um, for quality of life. And then broadening your understanding of choices through um, building self-efficacy. And a lot of that is kind of building that mindfulness muscle and understanding that, um, that you do have a choice in how you um, are going to react to situations, even if they are um, extremely difficult. So I just wanted to give just a few, uh, just a, uh, you know, some basic information about caregiver resilience, um, especially when we approach this difficult topic. And so uh, we're going to talk about end of life care in Lewy body dementia. And I want to start by um, just uh, describing what uh, palliative care is, because it really is um, the key approach. Um, that um, you know, at this point, we actually have evidence of improved quality of life for patients and care caregivers um, who receive palliative care 
um, with uh, Lewy body dementia. And so what is palliative care? I know that you did have um, uh, talk about this before, but I do just like to um, reflect on the World Health Organization definition, where um, really <clears throat> it focuses on Im improving quality of life and really intensive symptom management. Um, and palliative care affirms life, but also regards dying as a normal process. Um, <clears throat> we focus on helping the whole family cope during the illness and in bereavement, and palliative care is applicable in all stages of disease, early, late, um, and in conjunction with all other therapies as well. And then um, there is one study that actually showed that early palliative care um, uh, actually extended life, and this was in a population of, of um, patients with cancer. And so <clears throat> um, it's it would be, you know, of course, helpful to duplicate this in um, other populations, but this is very interesting because maybe we don't need to choose between quantity of life and quality of life. Maybe if we improve quality of life, then we actually um, are improving quantity of life. And so that's what the study here shows, at least in this population, that improving quality of life improved quantity of life. We may not need to choose. What is <clears throat> caregiver preparedness for end of life experiences? Well, there was recently a study published where they actually interviewed caregivers and their experiences. And what they said was that physicians rarely brought up end of life issues in a meaningful way. Only 22% received helpful information from their doctors. And fewer than half of caregivers uh, felt prepared for their uh, end of life care for their loved ones. So obviously um, we can do better and we should be doing better. And I'm hoping that um, with efforts like this, um, that uh, we're on the road to that goal. So what are some of the motor symptoms in advanced Lewy body dementia and towards end of life? There's increased stiffness and slowness, and this can cause um, pain. And um, if, body, um, if body parts are not moved, can, you know, in a regular way on a daily basis, then they can actually kind of form um, a contracture where the, um, the limb could be permanently in a certain position um, because the tendons get shorter and um, the bones fuse. And so it's important um, to just know that that's a potential risk and I'll talk about how to avoid contractures, but that is a risk with advancing Lewy body disease dementia. And um, also we have increased falls. So balance gets worse, but also there's a lot of impulsivity in the disease um, at advanced stages and patients will need 24 seven supervision um, for that reason to help uh, prevent falls. Um, patients will eventually become um, wheelchair dependent and many of them will become bedridden um, at the end of life. So how do we help avoid some of these consequences, the pain, the contractures? Well, we wanna make sure that we're doing range of motion exercises every day. So if, um, if your loved one isn't moving their limbs on their own, for example, if their right side um, of their body is more affected, maybe they don't move their right arm, you can actually uh, work with a physical therapist and an occupational therapist to understand good range of motion exercises so that um, you help avoid some of the consequences of immobility like contractures. Um, massage um, can be very helpful. Uh, pressure ulcers are um, a risk of uh, lack of mobility. So anyone who's wheelchair dependent or um, bedridden is at risk of developing a pressure ulcer. So you wanna make sure that the skin, good, that there's good skin care and the area is kept dry and clear, um, dry and clean. And you also wanna change positions every two hours for the patient, uh, for your loved one, if they're, for example, um, lying in the bed, then you wanna make sure that they're changing positions every two hours, and that will help reduce the risk of um, pressure ulcers. And then there's some um, specialized equipment like a gait belt or mechanical lifts that may be needed, and a physical therapist can help determine that. You want to make sure that if um, they're on a wheelchair, they're using specialized cushions or even specialized mattresses to prevent pressure ulcers. And then there is a specific kind of chair that I recommend um, when people reach end of life in Lewy body dementia, and that's a Broda um, chair that's specialized um, for uh, people with neurological, advanced neurological 
multiple disease and really helps um, maintain um, uh, independence, at least in terms of being able to bring your loved one in and out of different rooms and transfer them and care for them. So there are there is some specialized equipment that can be helpful. And of course, talking with your doctor and uh, nurse and um, physical occupational therapist is really the way to figure out what's best for uh, the person that you're caring for. I have here just different pressure points marked out, you know, of where um, people who are spending a lot of time in these positions might um, be at risk of developing um, pressure ulcers. So this is a um, provocative title and it's called Rehab to Death. And it's just something that I think is important to know because um, when people go into, so it was published last year, so it's a relatively new um, a finding, but, uh, basically, what these uh, researchers found was that a substantial number of older adults kind of cycle through going in and out of the hospital to subacute rehab and then back to the hospital and then subacute rehab um, in the last months of life. And that typically that's not a good quality of life for people and that the Medicare and Medicaid payment structures actually perpetuate the cycle. And so, um, you know, if your loved one gets hospitalized and then they recommend what's called a subacute rehab, um, just know that that isn't really a rehab facility. It's more of a post-acute care or convalescent home and that um, there are um, certain, um, and so actually in this article, they suggest that we no longer call these facilities subacute rehab facilities. We just call them post-acute care or even convalescent homes you might um, consider. So it's just something to think about um, when when people talk about subacute rehab and um, just for you to know that there is this feeling that it may actually be quite harmful. What about communication in advanced LBD? Um, at end of life, it may be um, very difficult to communicate with your loved one. There are voice changes and um, just cognitive issues that cause confusion and poor attention. People have trouble finding words. And so this uh, trouble communicating can lead to anxiety and agitation, of course. You know, some basic tips about uh, communication. You know, you, um, don't want to argue um, with your loved one, you know, if they're saying something that doesn't necessarily um, correspond to reality, you know, if there's a hallucination or something like that. Um, or a confusion, you can say yes and, and then maybe change the subject or, um, but, try, but don't argue. Um, you wanna find a, a place and time to talk without distractions and you really wanna make sure they're using a common uh, voice. Um, you know, tone of voice is really important, maintain eye contact. Um, and you wanna, you know, call your loved one by their name instead of he or she because um, that can be confusing. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and so, and you want to, you can also ask yes or no questions rather than open-ended questions and talk about one thing at a time. So these are just some tips about communication. Psychiatric symptoms in advanced LBD. So hallucinations um, can be severe and frightening. You wanna make sure that um, you tell your loved one's neurologist and psychiatrist about these symptoms. There are behavioral treatments like covering reflective services will reduce hallucinations, you know, just using a calm tone of voice, eye contact, those communication strategies, avoiding confrontation. Really at end of life, these symptoms are so severe that um, they are almost always need medications to control this, the, the symptoms. So it's really important, um, uh, you know, just to talk with, you know, at that point, hopefully there's gonna be a team of, of um, people coming in and helping with uh, the care of your loved one, but that uh, they should know about the hallucinations and that typically it will take medications um, at end of life just due to the severity of the symptoms. This is um, from the Family Caregiver Handbook. I just thought it was in, um, kind of they talk about the five R's when handling difficult behavior. So if your loved one has agitation or um, because they're scared of a hallucination or um, a paranoid thought or they can't communicate, they're frustrated. Um, and so, you know, just talks about remain calm, respond to, the, respond to your loved one's feelings, 
reassure them. You may need to actually remove yourself and then return again. Um, and you've been able to just recharge and come back um, uh, calm again. So um, just some basic strategies and you know, certainly just recognizing that these are um, challenging. These are, these are challenging symptoms. And what about eating and taking medications? So um, there are some uh, issues that pop up with uh, advanced LBD um, and especially with, at end of life. And uh, most, um, most people will need to uh, be helped with feeding at that point. Um, and so these are just some basic tips about that. Um, so you want to you know, encourage your loved ones to help with um, meal planning, get them as involved as they can be, let them have some choice in choosing what to eat and helping them only when they ask for it. Finger food um, can be a good idea. For example, um, you wanna make sure that they're in an upright position while they're eating. Um, and basically just let them know what you're doing. Um, you know, as you're giving them something, let them know what it is. After they've eaten, you want them to just sit upright for 20 to 30 minutes after a meal, and that will just help protect the airway. Um, so those are some basic suggestions. Um, so that's really, you know, in the case where someone has, um, or is unable to feed themselves, and that's why they're uh, are having challenging challenges with eating, but also in, uh, advanced LBD, um, people might refuse to eat. They might be paranoid and think that the food um, is poisoned um, or they, um, they may not be, their appetite actually might be reduced. Um, or they may um, not really, um, you know, be, be clear on what the, um, issues are if you're, for example, wanting them to have um, medications. They may not, they may be worried or paranoid about those medications or they may um, just not know what, why they're taking them. And the other issue is, you know, just uh, swallowing trouble itself causing um, aspiration, which is when food um, gets into the lungs itself and people have to cough it up or, um, or actual frank choking episodes. Also people will develop um, pocketing of their food or um, it's a swallowing apraxia, which means that people forget how to swallow. And so the food will stay in their mouth and they may not, um, they may not know that they need to swallow it. And so some recommendations to help, um, we uh, just the first thing is uh, we, don't, you, we don't recommend using thickeners. And I'll show some evidence about that um, soon, but um, thickeners have been shown to actually uh, make a quantity on, and potentially, uh, well, to make quality of life worse and potentially quantity of life worse as well. And so we don't recommend using them. Instead, um, try to give your loved ones smoothie consistency drinks and carbonated beverages. Mostly what they'll have trouble swallowing are, is thin liquids. Um, in terms of medications, you might wanna give it with applesauce or something of similar consistency because that might trigger people to swallow if they actually have food in their mouth. Uh, when, when your loved one is eating, you want to alternate between a bite of food and a sip of liquid. Bite of food, sip of liquid. So, you know, kind of people shovel food in their mouth a lot. <laughs> so that obviously is a danger for um, uh, the food going down the wrong pipe. So you want to just alternate a small bite of food, sip of liquid. And then if they practice a chin tuck, so, um, you know, if you just, if you can remind your loved ones to just tuck, the, tuck their chin downs when swallowing, that also helps um, protect the airway. And then I wrote benevolent trickery, which is really, you know, if people, um, if uh, sometimes with advanced LBD, um, you know, if people have symptoms like kosis um, and we're trying to, you know, they need to take a medication that will help reduce that symptom, especially if it's severe, then sometimes we might recommend that, you know, um, uh, loved ones are given that medication, maybe in food or other types of ways, you know, at that point, um, they don't have the capacity to really make the decision uh, that, you know, it's, uh, that they should take this medicine. Otherwise they will have um, very severe psycho psychotic symptoms. And so, you know, in that, in that scenario, it can be helpful to just make sure um, that your loved ones are, are um, not um, overwhelmed by, by um, 
symptoms that are bothering them, the psychotic symptoms. What about weight loss in advanced LVD? So um, weight loss is actually an inevitable part of the disease course. And um, it really is just a marker of end stage disease. So we see anorexia and cachexia. Another um, word for that is um, failure to thrive. <clears throat> And this is not responsive to any type of high calorie supplements or appetite stimulants. It's a, it's a, a marker of the advanced stage of the disease. So <clears throat> this, uh, this is our recommendations by Choosing Wisely, which is the American Board of Internal Medicine, um, looked at different treatments that we provide to older adults um, that uh, for no reason, they actually um, make quality and quantity of life worse. And they don't, they've never been shown to provide any benefit. They're considered medically futile. And so um, here we have um, avoid using prescription appetite stimulants or high calorie supplements for the treatment of anorexia or cachexia in older adults. And so because those things have not been shown to be effective. And I find that family members are often very focused on the weight because it is obviously very concerning to see that number drop. But it's not something that we can change. It's a marker of, of where they are in their disease course. Other things we do for no reason, um, thicken liquids. <clears throat> and this is in, a, in um, hospitalized adult patients with um, swallowing issues. Thickened liquids actually um, cause people to become dehydrated because they're so disgusting, people won't drink them. And then that can cause kidney dysfunction. Um, and that can, uh, um, uh, essentially shorten quantity of life. Certainly drinking th thickened liquids for um, patients uh, limits their, reduces their quality of life. So we don't recommend their use. And um, they, it's never been shown to actually uh, reduce any type of pneumonia or have any, uh, or have any benefit. And uh, also regarding feeding, um, it's, uh, we don't uh, recommend using feeding tubes in um, uh, individuals with advanced dementia anymore. This was a practice when I started medical school and in my residency, but in the last 10 years, it's been shown to actually be harmful. It does not improve quantity of life. It does not improve quality of life. In fact, quality of life is made worse. People become delirious from having the device put in. There's post-operative pain in that area and they may have infections and have to have the device put in again. And the care and caregiver burden after PEG tube placement in someone with advanced dementia also goes up significantly. And so um, we really don't recommend it. And I think there's a lot of concern that people have about, well, you know, um, what will happen to my loved one at the end of life if they're not eating? And what happens is that um, at the end of life, when people are not eating anymore, they're not hungry either because the dementia has progressed to that point that um, that desire for food or that feeling of hunger um, is not present anymore. Um, you know, from everything that we can see, um, there's no um, evidence that the person is uncomfortable. They're not um, asking for food in any way. They're not, um, <clears throat> their heart rate is normal and other types of things, you know, they're not grimacing in their face. So other types of things where we can see if someone's uncomfortable. And so all of the evidence really um, does not support any of these artificial feeding. What about incontinence and toileting in advanced LBD? So of course, this is a very um, private, typically very private experience. And so, um, you know, just some tips about, you know, just giving your loved one some privacy, looking away for a few moments, maybe leaving the room if it's safe to do so, giving them extra time, um, and just knowing that they might need some more help. Um, and also just acknowledging that it um, can be uncomfortable and embarrassing for them. Some of the um, interventions you can do, timed voiding, um, a pad inside their briefs provides extra protection if you're already using um, observant briefs. There is a Liberty catheter, which you can place. Um, it's just an external catheter that goes on at, um, at bedtime to help with this symptom. Um, and they can have a urinal or a commode at the bedside too. Um, and that can be helpful um, just for nighttime urination. 
Dental care should be continued. Um, this will be something that your loved one will need help with and, and full care eventually with, um, you know, brushing teeth twice a day. And actually just a little bit of lemon juice can initiate a swallowing um, for your loved one. It can just sort of clean their, clean their palate that way as well. As, as a Lewy body dementia progresses, people will have more and more fluctuations in alertness. And so they'll have times where they just feel, it just seems like they're zoned out. They're, they might be in the middle of talking or in the middle of walking and they're just not present for a moment and then they'll come back. So just know this is a natural part of the disease course. We actually don't know what is causing it exactly. We don't have any known treatment, but it's not a medical emergency. Nothing dangerous is happening at that time. And then to talk a little bit more specifically on um, end of life care days to weeks, you know, just creating comfortable surroundings. Most likely you're um, at that point, most people are, are bedridden, not everyone, but um, most. And so just making sure you're creating comfortable surroundings um, for, uh, for your loved one, just choosing favorite music, um, bringing nature indoors, you know, meaningful pictures, mementos, those types of things, even just, you know, having some lavender um, oil, soothing massage can be really helpful. You want to continue Cinemat for as long as possible. If it was helping your loved one, it will continue to help your loved one. You may need to lower the dose, but it will continue to help. Um, in general, though, you really want to reduce medication burden to only take what is critical. Um, when people, as they progress in the disease, they will have more trouble swallowing. And so, um, you know, medications can be changed to liquid formulations, if available, that's better, or suppositories. And at end of life, um, just something to know that most people will need sedating medications. Um, the uh, just to control the psychosis and, agi and terminal agitation in the end of life um, in people who have uh, LBD. What are some prognostic indicators in Lewy body dementia? So this is the Medicare hospice eligibility um, for adult failure to thrive. So basically people that have a, bo a body mass index less than 22, so that's actually within the normal range, um, but on the lower side. And then what's called a palliative performance scale of being mainly in bed and needing full assistance with um, activities of daily living, which basically means uh, someone that needs full care and is mainly um, in bed. And that is if, um, if your loved one is um, at that point, then uh, most likely they have um, uh, a limited life expectancy less than six months. Um, and and they, that person um, should get hospice to get the best um, care at end of life. And the Medicare hospice eligibility for dementia. So these are um, for people that uh, speak only one word clearly per day, cannot walk without personal assistance and are incontinent, and also um, have had either an episode of infection, serious infection, uh, uh, severe, you know, stage three or four, which is the most severe pressure ulcers, uh, or 10% uh, weight loss in the past 12 months. Um, and albumin is also a sign of significant malnutrition. Um, <clears throat> and weight loss, um, sp specifically malnutrition. And so those are the factors that, you know, if your loved one is in this position, um, is in this state, then they probably are at end of life and have um, a six month life expectancy. What do people die of in LBD? There's been very few studies on this, but um, most people will have uh, aspiration pneumonia as their terminal event. Um, sepsis, which can be either from a UTI or from pneumonia. Um, people can have uh, falls and fractures that lead to, um, that are their terminal event, um, or their uh, life-threatening event. And then failure to thrive, which I um, you know, was mentioning before, is when the people go through the natural process of end-stage dementia, where they, be, they um, begin to lose weight um, despite uh, high calorie supplements. It seems to just be a natural part of the disease process. <clears throat> so 
so it's important um, that you know if once you um, talk with your neurologist with your primary care doctor um, that you know these indicators are there and hopefully you've had an ongoing discussion with your um, with the neurologist and, and your and uh, your loved one's primary care doctor so that um, you know they're bringing taking you through this this process and helping you make the decision of when to call hospice it is uh, i do encourage the neurologist you know the your loved one's neurologist to continue being involved in hospice care and that's because um, so few people right now in this country with um, LBD die with hospice, less than 5%. And so men, um, their comfort care kits actually currently include medications that um, really people with uh, Lewy body dementia should not get. And so the neurologist really knows what those medications are. Um, but <clears throat> uh, in summary, it's um, haloperidol or haldol metoclopramide and, and phenergan. And so the, those are the medications. And again, um, we're not expecting you to be, you know, pharmacologist by the end of this talk. And so just know that there are medications that hospices usually give that they should not give to someone with, L, um, with LBD and that your neurologist can be involved in the hospice care to make sure that doesn't happen. What are predictors of mortality in LBD? So this is the one, so this one study actually looked at predictors of mortality within six to 12 months. And what it found was a body mass index of less than 18.5. So that's being, um, that is qualifies for being medically malnourished. And so that is the um, anorexia and cachexia stage that um, I had mentioned with failure to thrive. And then the other predictor is actually needing to reduce um, your loved one's cinemat due to psychiatric side effects. And that might be because, you know, if this, um, for example, this cinemat can cause psychosis. And so if that medicine has to be reduced, then movement becomes tougher. And then that, um, you know, is um, probably is what leads to the um, mortality within that period of time. But that, that is an indicator. Advanced care planning really important and really important to try to do um, as early as you can with your loved one and you know with your with your loved one's doctor and so this is the advanced directive that um, we like to use in our clinic and basically it's also available online through prepare for your care and it has three parts, one where you choose a medical decision maker, one where you make um, healthcare choices, and, and one where uh, your loved one signs, um, signs the form. So your loved one's choosing who they want to be their voice when they're not able to make decisions on their own. And, um, and then also um, can hopefully um, you know, make some healthcare choices as well and tell you what their preferences are. So, you know, on the forum, it talks about if you were so sick that you may die soon, what would you prefer? And so, um, you know, it asks people what, what would they, you know, what, what kind of care are they willing to have for the possibility of more time? These are questions that really, you know, as people become more advanced in their LBD, um, they're not able to answer these questions. And that's why it's, it's preferable to have these conversations early in the disease course. We ask people, um, what are some functions that you, or some things that you just um, can't imagine, you know, basically <clears throat> living with? So for example, you know, for, for some people, if they're not able to live without being hooked up to machines, that's not a good quality of life. And so if people, for other people, if they're not able to live on their own, that's not a good quality of life. We wanna, you know, so it's important to know for every person, what, um, what their values and priorities are for a good quality of life. And it is different for every person. There is a healthcare directive for dementia. And so, um, you know, goes at mild, moderate, and severe dementia, it defines what those are, and then basically, you know, <clears throat> gives people the ability to say, if I, have, if I have this level of dementia, this wouldn't be a, um, acceptable quality of life, uh, or, you know, for every person, they have a, a you know a different criteria, a different definition of what that is. For um, in terms of naming the healthcare proxy, so this is when you ask your loved one who they would like to be as their voice if they're not 
uh, able to speak for their for themselves and capacity to name a healthcare proxy um, so basically you know if someone has advanced dementia they may not be able to give a decision about a specific medical um, procedure but they may still be able to name who they would like to speak for them if they're not able to to um, make medical decisions for themselves and so those are two different levels of um, being able to you know make decisions name a healthcare proxy versus um, actually looking at a specific medical procedure and so <clears throat> it's still uh, if your loved one is not able to look at different medical um, decisions specifically, they may still be able to name you as a healthcare proxy. And that can be very important, um, you know, if, uh, when they do get sick and they're not able to talk, um, to speak for themselves that we know who to reach out to and who they would have wanted to talk for them. This is the physician order for life-sustaining therapy and it's called a pulse and it's filled out with your doctor. And it has three parts. Section A is about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Section B is about level of medical interventions, and Section C is about artificially administered nutrition. Section A is really important, um, CPR. So there's two choices, attempt resuscitation or do not attempt allow natural death. You know, um, the film industry has not done us any favors because when we look at movies and TV, 90% of people who are going to cardiac arrest um, get resuscitated successfully. Unfortunately, the real data shows that only 5% of people, especially older adults with dementia, if they have a cardiac arrest, only five out of 100 will be resuscitated successfully and will be able to ever leave an institutional setting like a hospital or a nursing home. Many of those that are resuscitated um, you know, will, will require life support um, interventions um, so it's just, you know, I tell people there's no right or wrong answer, but it's important to know it's not like the movies and that the chances of a good recovery is actually quite small. And, and that's just important to know. In terms of medical interventions is really, you know, full treatment has to do with uh, uh, intensive care unit, life support, intubation. Selective treatments is typically everything except for critical care. Um, everything except for life support. And then comfort focused treatment is, you know, when people really don't want to go to the hospital again. They're ready to, um, to just be at home and be as comfortable as they can. Artificially administered nutrition. So long term artificial nutrition I mentioned was an option um, in uh, this advanced directive earlier and that um, uh, we don't recommend that. Actually, I cross that off for my patients because we know that that is harmful. A trial period of artificial nutrition would be, um, you know, if your loved one, God forbid, got a stroke and had, was weak, but then in a few months got stronger. So they may have needed a feeding tube for a few months, but then got stronger and it was taken out. So that's a trial period of artificial nutrition or no artificial nutrition. So that's something that um, hopefully you and your loved one can discuss or you've already discussed and know their wishes. So this is just, again, just reminding you that um, long-term artificial nutrition does not prolong life or improve life and we don't recommend it. And just um, a great book that was published a few years ago called Being Mortal, um, Medicine and What Matters in the End. Our most cruel failure in how we treat the sick and the aged is the failure to recognize that they have priorities beyond merely being safe and living longer. We want to know what those priorities are. You might be thinking, I don't know, how do I, how do I figure that out? What does that mean? What are my priorities? Um, two questions to ask yourself and to talk about with your doctors. Um, and you know, if you um, have a, a clinical team that you work with <clears throat> for your loved one. And the two questions are, if you look ahead, what worries you the most? And on the flip side, when you look to the future, what are you hoping for? And you can have more than one hope. Sometimes people say, I'm hoping for a cure. I am too. I'm hoping for a cure as well. What else are you hoping for? Let's try to figure out all, the, all those other things that you're hoping, that people are hoping for as well. And especially when they're an end of life and when time is so, is so precious. As Atul Gawande said in Being Mortal, our ultimate goal after all is not a good death, but a good life to the very end. Thank you. Let's take questions.
Thank you, Maya. Yeah, um, we've had a couple questions and I just want to encourage people to use the Q&A icon at the bottom of their screens to type them in. Um, Sam just mentioned that it would be helpful to have a comparison chart that describes the difference between standard of care and palliative care um, when you showed that it um, can improve quality and quantity of life to have palliative care. Um, and Wendy was asking you to, to reinforce um, or re-explain kind of when death is expected within six months. And, and maybe it might be good to clarify there's a hospice eligibility criteria, kind of when they indicate that prognosis might be six months and how accurate that is for people with Lewy body dementia. Yeah, so <clears throat> the data we have is really scarce. Um, I think the only study that really looked at um, Lewy body, uh, people with Lewy body dementia and, and predictors of six to 12 months is the um, body mass index less than 18.5. Um, which is uh, med med being medically malnourished. So um, at that point, people will have um, a, a anorexia and, and failure to thrive um, or reducing their psychiatric medication significantly so that their mobility is worse. Those, those were two things that really popped up. That's the only study that has ever been published that I'm aware of. Um, and I've done some you know, pretty thorough reviews. Um, and then the hospice criteria really you know, ha have more to do with um, uh, traditionally um, Alzheimer's patients, for example, um, or failure to thrive even in advanced cancer patients. So really they're not anything that's been studied in um, people that have LBD or any other neurological condition. So um, that's kind of an arbitrary eligibility criteria. Pamela was just asking if you could go back to that slide that shows that um, hospice eligibility criteria. Another question that came up was um, when uh, you mentioned a Broda chair, and I'm curious if that's something that's um, covered by Medicare or other insurance or what or how people get those chairs. Yeah, it's covered by Medicare for hospice. It's actually okay. when someone is in hospice, they can get it easily. I've tried to get people Broda chairs otherwise, and they just, it's not covered. You have to, um, at least I haven't figured out how to get it covered. And um, uh, for, just to remind me what it looks like, it's like a, a reclining, more, more padded kind of wheelchair type of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's a tilt in space. Um, and so for people that are bedridden, they can actually be transferred to that and, you know, be able to, uh, you know, I had a patient who lived in uh, assisted living was able to go and have dinner with his friends at the assisted living in their cafeteria that way um, at the end of life. And so it made a big impact for that, you know, for that person. Mm -hmm. And Kathy says that um, she's a support group facilitator and she gets a, you know, she works with caregivers who are really worried about um, trouble swallowing and panic when they see coughing or signs of aspiration. So, um, you know, how, how, what could she, what kind of information could she offer to them to help them feel more comfortable with kind of moving away from thickened liquids and trying something else like carbonated liquids? Yeah. So I tell them, um, well, first I tell them that thickened liquids actually um, have, don't help anything, right? So that it actually causes harm. Um, but, and so I just, I tell people to, to get like a wall of smoothies or make smoothies at home um, and carbonated beverages and the chin tuck. And I found those really simple things actually help a lot. Um, people will have fewer episodes of swallowing trouble just by doing the chin tuck actually is a very powerful technique. Um, so I, I just tell them, you know, to try to minimize thin liquids. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that, if that's helpful. Um, you know, it's, it's important that, <clears throat> just alternating between a sip of food, small a, a small bite of food, a sip of liquid, back and forth is really important because a lot of people just sort of shovel it in. Um, and I, you know, I've sometimes remind people that you can get liquid through food sometimes, like steamed vegetable, steamed vegetables mm -hmm. that are really soft have a high liquid content. There's, you know, like you mentioned, sm Oops. fruit smoothies, yogurt, ice cream. They're, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as much as possible to try to move, you know, move towards that. Um, and then, you know, everyone sort of has their own goals, what's important to them. So I've had patients who it's really important that they have their, their um, 
pizza or whatever, right? So even if they might have a choking issue on it, they're willing, you know, sort of, we've talked about this for a long time and that's what's important to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that overall, you know, it's always the big picture, right? If, you know, as Atul Gawande says, you know, if, if our if our goal was just to live as long as possible and be as safe as possible, no one would ever cross the street, right? I mean, it's the most dangerous thing that we do every day. Um, not, not in quarantine, but, you know, in real life, in normal life. Um, Putting the risk so. in perspective. Yeah, I think caregivers can, you know, as a caregiver, you take on so much responsibility and you want to do the best you can. And sometimes, you know, there's just some unavoidable risk if you're trying to provide quality of life. Robin's asking about if Medicare covers palliative care during the early stages of Lewy body dementia. It does actually. So I'm in a palliative care clinic every Friday for um, Parkinson's and related disorders, you know, which includes LVD. <clears throat> so yeah, we see people as often as we need to. Um, and we, I continue to see people about once a month, even if they're on hospice, um, Medicare will pay for me to see them. Uh, through telemedicine. So there's, yeah, they seem to pay for it. And I actually see patients with a, <clears throat> a palliative care doctor and me, and we have our whole clinical team. And um, yeah, I think it's financially works. Yeah. So med it, we can say that it's covered and give the caveat that it may, it may not be available broadly, unfortunately, but that's yeah. something we can advocate for. Yeah. And, you know, we can see people across California because uh, we have telemedicine. And we're not required to see people um, in person first. So that's great. And I think, you know, especially that's one silver lining with the COVID pandemic, as it seems like telemedicine is really expanding. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. an anonymous person who's asking about straws, using straws for liquids, sippy cups or spoon fed. Um, not sure how much detail we want to get into this. I think there's, there's some level of, I've heard different opinions about straws and I don't know that there's a lot of research. Maybe you have an opinion about them. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, straws are not recommended because they actually increase aspiration risk. Um, I think that's just a question to ask a, a speech pathologist because there are some people where they do recommend straws. And so I think they really have that level of knowledge to know who should, who shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But in general, it's a bad idea. It increases the risk of fluid kind of shooting in back in the back of the throat and then going into the lungs. Um, there is something called a safe straw, which is just like a... Um, only allows you to sip a small amount. Um, I, I don't think there's really evidence that it's helpful, but um, yeah. And Sharon's asking again a prognosis question around what time frame you would expect if someone's in stage six, well into it. Um, maybe you want to go back to the the one study that's been done that that if someone has to reduce their cinemet and if their BMI is less than eighteen. Yeah, yeah. And you know, these other, for example, the Medicare hospice eligibility for dementia, I think is probably going to be pretty accurate for DLB because, um, you know, if someone has, um, is really uh, wheelchair bound, um, you know, unless they have a personal assist, they're not really speaking, they're fully incontinent, um, and they've had a recent 10% weight loss or um, serious infection admission, then that person probably does have a, a um, less than a year life expectancy, if not six months. And so I think, you know, probably this is um, accurate, uh, as accurate as we have. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So then someone is asking if someone can qualify for hospice if they're at stage 7C, but they haven't had any of the aspiration or any of the other incidents that you mentioned. Um, I guess in my experience, it really varies by the hospice. So um, I've seen some hospice agencies, you know, it, it, I, I, in my opinion, it doesn't hurt to, to try to reach out and, and see if you can be accepted because it can be helpful to have that, that level of care. But I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I think it is. Some hospices really go by this like eligibility and they won't do anything else, but most, most of them will just use their clinical judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that if someone, um, you know, really is at that cusp, we want to try to get in at six months. We don't want to try to get in the last few days, right? So if we're a little bit early on board, that, that's sort of, I think, where a lot of hospices try to be at so they can get that full six months of care to someone. And someone else was going back to the communication slides. If, if someone doesn't process reality well and they think they're in an airport, how would you recommend responding? 
Yeah. I mean, I think that in, in general, you want to try not to argue with the person, right? So, because that's their reality. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, you just want to make sure that you're um, remaining calm and not confrontational and not, um, uh, you know, dismissing what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. Um, you know, essentially, is it uh, frightening for the person or worrisome for the person? If it's not, then it's, you know, might be something where you can say, oh, yes, and, you know, we can change to a different topic. Um, uh, and so, you know, try to sort of move them to kind of something else to focus on. Mm -hmm. But if they're also just in the airport and they're not bothered by it, that might just be what they're, what they do, you know, right. for the period. And, and, you know, maybe I sometimes I've thought like, oh, um, you know, it, I think people are afraid to kind of reinforce a hallucination or a delusion. Um, and sometimes I've found like, if you say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be going on a vacation right now? Where would you want to go? You know, you can kind of shift the conversation that without arguing with them and kind of, um, kind, but be able to imagine a different reality. And then there's Mary who says, I'm, I think we've had a question from her before around um, her. So her mom is 96 and she's in a nursing home and the nursing home is not knowledgeable about Lewy body dementia and they're waking her up. Um, she's sleeping a lot. She's in the advanced stage and she's, Mary's having difficulty advocating and um, also not able to, to go in and help feeding her. Uh, do you have any advice for that situation? So, I mean, there's so much there, right? Um, that I think there's a helplessness there as well, right? Because you can't be there um, with your mom to, um, you know, in, in person to help out, and you're and you're feeling like <clears throat> this the place itself is not a good environment for her. Um, I um, I'm I think it's. It's just a, it's a difficult situation. I'm not sure. I don't know, Sarah, if you have advice on. Yeah, I mean, I guess in my experience, it's been helpful to have doctors on board. So I guess if the if you have a neurologist who can help provide education to the staff, or even say, you know, it's okay to let her sleep, and and maybe consider the hospice eligibility criteria because hospice can also help advocate for better care for people. And I think that's why sometimes that, that can lead to better quality of life. It, it is difficult, especially now, but even when you're able to be there in person to advocate for care in institutions, because there, there's just so many barriers um, from staffing to education to all kinds of things. Um, so I, I think, you know, trying to build your team up. The other thing is considering talking to an ombudsman. Um, to help advocate and 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 really that reinforcing that the goal is her quality of life. Um, so um, I, I, we're running out of time. We have a couple more questions. A quick one from Robin is, does UCSF handle brain donations for LBD patients or do they refer them to Mayo or elsewhere? Um, I, you know, I, my sense is that people could talk to their doctors if they go to UCSF um, about brain donation or organizations like the Brain Support Network um, can help connect people. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, for, I think if, you know, patients are seen at the Memory and Aging Center, then, um, you know, there are different studies or different opportunities for them to do that as well. Uh, another question about someone sleeping 17, 18, 25, and 31 hours straight, like intermittent episodes, um, and then resuming her normal cognition and behaviors. Does this indicate disease progression, this amount of sleeping? Probably. Unfortunately, yeah. probably, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to end with the final question. I want to thank Wendy for this question. She emailed me. She says, my husband is totally deaf. I hear and read about what you can do while they're dying, i.e. tell them how much you love them, talk about life experiences that make them happy, tell them I will miss him dearly, but I will be okay, play soft music, etc. Sadly, none of this will be heard because he's deaf. So how do I communicate at the end of this journey so that he knows I'll be okay, I'll miss him, and I'll always love him? Hmm. I just thought that was a really beautiful question. And I think the fact that she asks it, I can imagine that she is probably expressing that 
in many ways, you know, language is one way that we communicate. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even just, um, just touch, you know, just having a, a, a gentle touch or, um, you know, sometimes just using something like lavender oil and giving a massage can be really, really lovely for people, um, for both um, the person with the illness and their caregiver. Um, so, you know, even the, <clears throat> so I, th I think, I think, yeah, it's, it's probably coming through in other ways, um, as Sarah is saying, and that um, I think just, just um, people can, you know, feel your presence there, right? If you're, you know, if you're there and your loved one kind of feels your touch and, and knows that it's, it's, you're there with them, then that can be very powerful. Yeah, I know I've done some um, Zen hospice training and, and they talk about, you know, breathing together, timing your breathing together, that sort of rhythm. And, um, and then just looking at pictures too, um, if he still has his visual senses in addition, and um, I was talking to a colleague and she said, well, what about making a big sign that says something simple like, I love you, <laughs> um, you know, I'll love you, I'll miss you, I'll be okay. I think that's a beautiful message. Um, so, but thank you for that question. I think that's a good reminder to all of us to remember to tell people how much they matter to us while we can. So thank you, Maya. And thank you everyone for your participation and your beautiful questions. Um, and just a reminder that this presentation will be um, posted on our website and will be emailed to you tomorrow. We'll also have a survey and we really appreciate your feedback. If you take the time to complete the electronic survey, that'll be emailed tomorrow as well. Thanks again, everyone. Okay, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.